those viewers who have seen my earlier videos on adventures in fuel transfer will have seen the uh, the one I did where I mounted a hand cranked fuel pump up on a wooden um, column essentially that would allow me to position it high or low for different types of fuel cans and equipment and that works really well and I use it a lot but there are a few places where I just find it unwieldy and one of those is pumping fuel out of my generator so I decided to augment my collection of fuel transfer pumps with an electric pump in this case by Terra Pump their uh, TREP01-T uh, which is sort of a, a handheld pedestal type of pump with a telescoping or telescopic uh, suction pipe. Here's what comes in the box. By the way this product is roughly sixty dollars on Amazon at the time of making this video. You get the the pedestal assembly which is the part with the gray handle on the left that's also the battery compartment and then the telescoping plastic pipe that's white which ends in the combination pump motor and pump impeller which is the slightly wider area at the far right of the pipe then at the juncture between the pipe and the battery compartment is a black hose I think it comes out to be something like 38 inches long uh, which connects to the uh, the handle with the squeeze lever and then the black nozzle which you know obviously fits into whatever you're pumping the fuel in here's with the pipe in its fully retracted position at this point it's about 15 and a half inches uh, between the tip of the pump uh, the you know the bottom end of the pump where it would contact the bottom of a fuel can for example and the uh, area where the gray handle starts uh, so you get about 15 and a half inches there so that's the whole length of that light um, light gray pipe section and then here's a view of the pipe in its fully telescoped or fully extended position in which case its length goes from 15 and a half inches up to 21 inches Here's a close-up of the pump. It's just that little conical section closest to the the viewer with the blue impeller inside of it. So that's where the fuel gets sucked up in. This impeller is just a uh, simple centrifugal type of arrangement and is very similar to what you'd see in a sump pump or something like that. It does not. It's not positive displacement. So if you have the pipe blocked or something it can still spin and not really damage anything and then the rest of that larger diameter section just below the impeller is where the electric motor is in and how does the power get to it well there is a flexible and fuel proof uh, electric cable that runs up from the motor assembly up through that telescoping pipe and up to the battery housing in the handle also note the three little protuberances that surround the opening by the impeller and that's so even if this pump uh, motor head assembly goes all the way down to the bottom of a fuel can for example or a fuel tank uh, it won't get blocked because those tabs hold the uh, impeller opening a little bit clear of the bottom of the tank or can Here's a view of the handle. It has the red squeeze grip or lever on it and this actually is what regulates the fuel flow. The motor is turned on and off for the pump and just runs but by squeezing this lever you can actually um, prevent fuel flow if you don't squeeze it or allow fuel flow if you do squeeze it. And also there is a sort of a rotating collar which you can see there has kind of a red hook on it and if you turn that it has a couple of functions one is that it allows you to slightly regulate or not regulate but vary the amount of flow I think it presents some sort of a, a restriction to flow so you can kind of throttle it down a little bit or allow it to be wide open 
and also by rotating it further it serves as a lock for the lever so it'll hold it in the squeezed position. And here's a view of the collar rotated such that it's locking the lever in the squeezed position. Now when you're not actually using the pump the base of the battery holder in the handle has a couple of plastic rings into which the nozzle can fit and it just holds it in there and then there's a big hook up on the top of the battery holder which you can use to hold the um, the whole assembly up on a wall or something when you're not using it and in that position the way this uh, nozzle is being held up there by the battery compartment means that the fuel will not run out of it if there's anything left in the in the hose here's the battery compartment in the handle with the slide off cover removed and the unit is designed to be powered by a pair of D cells. You'd probably use alkaline. I think that's what it's really intended for. And because the unit takes a fair amount of power to pump, uh, you really do need those larger size D cells. Up on the top of the handle at the end of the battery compartment is the slide switch for turning the pump on and off. As I mentioned earlier, this does not mean that uh, fuel will flow out of the nozzle even when it's turned on. This just means that the pump will be running. Uh, if you don't squeeze the lever on the handle then fuel will still not flow out. Here's a typical application for the pump. I've got a five gallon gas can on the left and um, I think it's like a maybe a two gallon gas can on the right. I'm going to pump from the bigger one into the smaller one. Here's how the pump would insert into the can. I don't need to have it telescoped out here. It's in its short position for a can of this size. And then the hose extends over and the nozzle just sticks into the smaller fuel can's opening. Here you can see the pump running at full flow or unrestricted flow. You get a pretty decent column of fuel coming out of it. Uh, the advertised or specified flow rate is variously 2.4 gallons per minute or 2.5 gallons per minute depending on which documentation you look at. Note that this product has no safety features. If the fuel in the tank you're pumping into rises up to the level of contacting the nozzle, there's nothing to stop the flow. It'll just overflow so you are supposed to stay there with it while you're pumping but as I mentioned before you can at least squeeze the handle you don't have to hold the handle in all the time if you're pumping into a bigger tank you could theoretically pump for hours uh, if you're moving a lot of fuel from something although really for that you should use a more powerful pump um, and there so there's no sensor and nothing automatically releases the the lever on the handle Here's an example of how the pump can be stowed or stored away. I actually, in my basement, I have several things like uh, inflators and pressure gauges and things that I just sort of hang up from a piece of conduit. And uh, I decided that also works pretty well for hanging this pump up when not in use. Once again, there's a rather generously sized hook at the very top of this unit uh, right up by the power switch at the top of the battery compartment in the handle and that will um, and by handle there I mean the handle you would grab to hold the pump not the handle that has the lever on it over by the nozzle and that hook allows you to go over objects of fairly large size for the purpose of hanging the pump for storage it doesn't have to be some tiny little wire hook or anything. It can be over something like a pipe or a piece of conduit or you know dowel rod pegs on the wall or anything like that. Since I'll be storing this thing for probably a good six months out of the year without using it and then using it quite a bit the other half of a year, 
um, I put a piece of masking tape over the bottom once I made sure there was no fuel left in it trying to drip out. And that's really just to keep the inevitable spiders and things from trying to make a nest or something in the impeller. Although it all can be dismantled, you know, it all screws apart and you could take it apart and clean it if something like that were to happen. I just pre prefer to be more preventative. I'm also concerned about leaving batteries, especially alkaline batteries, in things that um, I won't be checking up on regularly. Uh, you can have a leak in there and have a lot of damage done before you notice it. So in cases like this, I tend to take the batteries out but keep them near the tool. Here I just stuck it inside of a hardware store uh, screw plastic bag and uh, masking taped it to the handle so it'll be there and easily accessible. Okay, some specifications for the TREP01-T. The delivery volume is uh, 9 liters per minute or 2.4 gallons per minute. The suction pipe length varies from roughly 15 and a half inches to, I think I said, 21 inches. Uh, and the operating temperature it's rated for is plus 5 degrees Celsius to 40, 40 degrees Celsius or 41 degrees Fahrenheit to 104 degrees Fahrenheit. The operating voltage is 3 volts, which is what you get from the 2D cells. The discharge length is uh, of the hose is approximately 1 meter or 3.3 uh, feet. Um, you know, I measured 38 inches, so, yep. Yeah. Uh, applicable liquids that this is designed and rated for, uh, gasoline, diesel fuel, DEF, uh, add blue in other words. I'm not really sure what that is, but that's what it has in the spec. Water, although they suggest not using it for potable water. Uh, kerosene, antifreeze, windshield washer fluid, mild detergents, agricultural chemicals, and light oils. Uh, you should not use this pump for transferring the following liquids. Acetone, benzene, Cresol, Cresol, C-R-E-S-E-O-L, S-O-L, I don't know what that is. Ethyl, phenol, methyl ethyl, I presume that includes methyl ethyl ketone, concentrated caustic soda liquids, nitric acid, hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid, thinners, and other solvents. It says, etc. It does not mention isopropyl alcohol um, or, you know, uh, I would presume you could transfer isopropyl alcohol in here, but that's a common liquid that you might want to pump, and I could see where this might work or not work with it. I wish that they would mention that one. This product works well for me. Uh, I've tried it in several applications, and it always pumped easily, conveniently, and at a good flow rate very easy to use. Seems to be of decent quality, but only time will tell how well it holds up. Reading a lot of other reviews of it, a lot of people are very happy with it, have been using it for quite a while, but there's also a lot of people commenting and reviewing that there's crapped out after a very short period of time. The warranty on this is one year, and I've been told and have read that uh, TerraPump is very good about replacing ones that have failed. Um, so they're in California, uh, they're not overseas somewhere. The other thing is, I'm not sure where this product is made. It doesn't say on the manual, and I didn't see anywhere on the product itself where it's made or on the box. Although another Terra pump, pump that I have says made in Korea on it. Uh, I'm guessing that's where this one is made. The other uh, battery-operated fuel transfer pump that I bought about the same time is the TerraPump TRFA01, just labeled as a fuel transfer pump. This product costs roughly $80 on Amazon at the time of making this video. I bought this pump to replace a failing uh, siphon-type transfer pump made by Scepter, their flow-and-go max flow 
model. Um, I have a one of my earlier adventures in fuel transfer videos talks about that and my hacks for it. It developed an internal leak and actually the third part of this video will be uh, looking into that but I thought it might be interesting to have an electric pump replace that thing even though I still went out and bought another replacement scepter flow and go um, which I'll just keep on the shelf in case this thing doesn't work out. Here's what comes in the box. You get the entire pump and hose assembly. There's a suction hose with the pump and motor assembly at the end of it. This is almost identical to the one at the end of the suction pipe on the previously reviewed um, Terra pump that I just talked about a few minutes ago. Uh, but it has a flexible hose going up to the battery compartment and then after that it has a very similar discharge hose. Uh, the nozzle on the other hand is quite a bit simpler than on the previously reviewed product. You still have the battery compartment up top which also has the power switches for the pump. There are also three uh, fuel can adapters. Those are the three round black plastic things. Those are sized to hopefully cover all of the major brands of plastic gas cans sold in North America. In my experience, I found that one of them fitted both of the Blitz brand cans. I had a one gallon and a five gallon, and another one of them fit all of my no spill brand cans, regardless of size. I'm not sure about the third one, what that might fit, but another popular brand is Scepter, that's S-C-E-P-T-E-R. Maybe it fits that brand, I don't know, because I don't have any of those cans anymore. Here's another view of the motor and impeller pump, or centrifugal pump, uh, housing that has both those things in it. And uh, here's uh, end view showing the blue centrifugal impeller. This one is also rated for something like 2.4 gallons per minute transfer rate. I don't think I mentioned it with the other pump, but it, that applies to both that one and this one, that the pump is powerful enough to lift fuel up the entire length of the discharge hose if that hose is held vertically. So, for example, you might be pumping from a gas can sitting on the floor or the ground and up into even something like a you know a small garden tractor or something where you might have to pump up you know two three feet uh, in elevation and it'll certainly do that. As with the other pump, the power gets from the the battery housing down through the hose to the pump motor assembly via a flexible fuel proof cable that runs through. Unlike the other pump, you can actually see it here because the hose is transparent. The nozzle on this pump is much simpler. It doesn't have a even a handle, really, uh, or a, a lever to squeeze. It's just a plastic tube, really. Uh, but, unlike the other one, it has a plastic spring clip with a kind of a hook on the end, which can hook on to the lip of things like uh, fuel fillers on automobiles or onto the threads on the fuel opening of fuel tanks on things like lawnmowers and snowblowers just to keep it from falling out. Unlike the previously reviewed Terra Pump fuel transfer pump, the nozzle on this one does have an electronic sensor on it. You can kind of see it within a smaller round chamber just inside the discharge opening of the nozzle. I didn't look at it too carefully, but I think it's probably just a pair of tiny um, electronic probes, you know, essentially detecting the conductivity of the fluid when the fluid comes in contact with the end of the, the uh, nozzle as it rises up in a fuel tank. Everything on this pump comes in towards the central point of the battery housing. You can see both the suction hose, which is on top in this view, and the discharge hose on the left being held 
between my thumb and forefinger, and then the main battery housing, which is the part with the red lid on the bottom. And there's also this hole you can see aiming towards the camera, and that is the uh, stowage or storing dock where you can stick the end of the nozzle and it kind of clips in there just to hold it in place when you're not using it. You can also see the rotating ring uh, which surrounds the suction hose and that is what screws onto the selected fuel can adapter, those black plastic ones I talked about previously. So you screw the a can adapter onto the fuel opening of your gas can and then that has a common thread on the top to which this gray uh, docking ring screws onto. It doesn't really need to seal anything because uh, the fueling is not taking place right at the opening of the gas can. Rather it's taking place from down at the other end of the suction hose where the pump is. Note that there is no provision for child safety, for example, on this. Anybody can unscrew that docking ring. Um, it doesn't have a ratchet or anything you have to squeeze or do special to keep it from being unscrewed by a kid or somebody. Um, so you have to take that into account. Here's the label on the battery housing, and it just notes that it is made in Korea and that it operates at 3 volts DC and I'm going to get to that right now. Here's the battery housing with the red cover removed. It holds four double A sized cells to form the battery and it's interesting that this product actually appears to put the batteries in a series parallel arrangement. So you can um, put just the two middle batteries in or the two middle cells and you'll still get three volts and the pump will run quite happily on that but you won't get as much battery life so if you really are short on batteries you can still pump if you just put two double A cells in there in the middle positions but for normal use you should put all four in and I think they're either electronically paralleled with the inner two or they're simply paralleled just by wiring them in parallel I'm not sure which Note that I put in lithium cells here. Um, I chose lithium because this particular product will remain in the gas can in my garage all year round, whether it's hot or cold, especially cold. And I'll be fueling things all year round, whether it's lawnmowers and things in the summer or snowblowers in the winter. And therefore I want this to always work. And I found that the lithium cells seem to do better when it's really cold, especially when it's free, you know, well below freezing. And also, they're not that likely to leak, so I don't have any real worries about leaving them in there unattended for extended periods. I probably would have used uh, lithium cells for the other pump I talked about earlier, except that none of the stores I go to carry lithium cells in a D size. Here's the little control panel, such as it is, on the front face of the battery housing. It just has a momentary button for on and another momentary button for off. These are membrane type switches, so they're sort of kind of waterproof or water resistant anyway, and dirt resistant. Um, there's got to be some sort of electronics in there uh, to sort of lock in the circuit once you push the on button and then cancel that when you push the off. This also allows the sensor in the end of the nozzle to act as a second off button essentially. So um, it makes sense that instead of a slide switch or something here it's got the two electronically operating operated push buttons. So let's do a virtual assembly of this. First the appropriate fuel can adapter goes on. Then we fit the motor pump housing on the end of the uh, suction or inlet tube 
through the fuel can adapter and then that's followed by the suction hose itself until you get to this point where you can screw the the collar on the battery housing onto the fuel can adapter. The length of the suction hose is such that on a typical five gallon can the suction hose will allow the pump motor housing to either rest right on the bottom of the can or hang vertically uh, so that it's more or less touching the bottom, depending on the design of the can. Uh, it's also designed so some of these uh, flat pack type uh, cans that are popular now and can be kind of attached to the sides of Jeeps and things like that, that the, the suction hose is long enough to you know, reach far enough into those that you can pump the fuel out. Uh, if you use a smaller can, or you know, for example, a one or two gallon gas can, then you're going to end up with the the motor pump housing laying on the bottom of the can, uh, and the flexible suction hose just kind of curled up above that. It doesn't matter. Um, there shouldn't be any situation where the suction opening on the uh, centrifugal pump is anywhere other than at or right near the bottom of the gas can. Here are a couple of photos showing how when you're not using the pump that the nozzle can dock into the recess in the side of the battery holder and just hold it there and that way the the uh, discharge hose makes a loop and nothing should drain out. But if you were to push the on button for some reason while you're doing this it would try to pump and it would immediately flood that um, that docking chamber with fuel which would activate the sensor in the nozzle and shut the pump right back off again. Here's a detailed look at the actual nozzle and you can see there's two kind of like fingers sticking out that you can squeeze between thumb and forefinger. One of them doesn't move, that's the one my thumb is on, and the one that my finger is on there is the one that is kind of like a spring clip. And then there's a little hook on the end which um, when you push down on the the little lever with your finger, the spring clip moves away from the side of the nozzle and therefore you can slip it over the opening of a fuel can or a, a filler tube or what have you on your equipment and it'll help hold it there. Here is an important caveat with this product and I may have already touched on it before, I can't remember, but I'm going to say it again because it is important. The manufacturer strongly recommends that you always have your source and destination gas cans oriented such that you're pumping uphill. In other words, the receiving uh, fuel container or tank should be at a higher level than uh, the, the opening of the source can or tank. When you stop the pump, the fuel that's in the discharge hose and the nozzle will flow by gravity in whichever direction is lower. And if you happen to have, like in this picture where my five gallon gas can, that's the source, is up on a raised platform, which I had to have it that way when I had my old siphon pump in there. Uh, in this instance, uh, when you turn the pump off, all that fuel that's in the discharge hose and the nozzle itself will run by gravity down into wherever the receiving tank is on a lawnmower in this case. And assuming you shut off the pump when that tank was full, you'll now add, you know, whatever it is, a couple more cups of fuel, uh, in which will overflow the tank. And that's obviously going to make a big mess. Depending where you are, are you just wasting fuel or... It could be, you know, a hazard or cause some sort of damage or other problems. So you really should situate things so you're always pumping at least a little bit uphill. And then when you stop the pump, the fuel will flow backwards into the tank where the fuel came from. The discharge hose on this pump is 34 inches long. And then the nozzle itself is 4 inches long, so as long as you're pumping in certain orientations with the nozzle, you could think of it as a 38-inch long 
total length of hose from the battery housing to the tip of the nozzle. Some places say that this is an expandable hose, like it'll telescope out or something. It does not. Because it's a corrugated hose, it has a certain amount of springiness to it, um, you know, much like a vacuum cleaner hose or something would. But it's always going to try to return to its nominal length. Uh, so you can't really think of it as an expanding hose. It's 34 inches long, period. Uh, here are the products that you're not supposed to pump with this, according to the manual. Do not use for drinkable liquids, water or otherwise. Do not use with any kind of thinners or solvents. Do not use with hot liquids. Do not use with acetone, benzene, cresol, creosol, ethyl phenol, methyl ethyl, concentrated caustic soda, liquids, nitric acid, hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid, etc. But you can use it for gasoline, kerosene, diesel, light oils, non-potable uh, water, and things like that. Applicable to both of these pump products is the previously noted question about is isopropyl alcohol suitable for this. Uh, looking it up, ethyl alcohol is definitely not the same as isopropyl alcohol. They are different things. Uh, However, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's okay to use isopropyl alcohol with these pumps, uh, even though the specifications only mention ethyl. Um, so I would treat that with caution unless you can get the manufacturer to clarify it for you. I have the same opinion at this early stage of my use on this product as I do with the previously described uh, Terra pump product. It seems to be well designed. It seems to be made out of quality materials and well assembled. It seems like it should work and you know last a long time. But again, I see quite a few reviews saying that they crap out early. It may be nothing to do with things like how well the, the physical thing. It may be they cheaped out on the battery contacts or maybe the electronics for latching in the um, the on button, for example, maybe those fail. I don't really know. Time will tell. Those viewers who have watched my video on fuel adventures and fuel transfer, or whatever I called it, um, one of my mainstays in my setup has been this uh, product here. This is the Flow and Go. Um, it's a siphon pump with a squeeze pump built into the handle so you can get the siphon started and then use siphoning through the handle using the pump lever to control the amount of flow and to shut it off when you're done. The other end of the hose goes into typically a fuel can and uh, one of my videos talks about how I was hacking the design like this so as to not always get a kink in the hose where it comes out of the fuel can like that. Um, this thing has developed a leak where it dribbles gas out of the handle assembly when I'm siphoning and I'm not sure if it's a problem with the starter pump or just a general leak so I thought I would try it again here um, with just some water in my utility sink going into a bucket and see if I can reproduce the leak. Hopefully I've got this thing where it'll be viewable. Yeah, so I think I've got everything in the picture here. So I'm going to come down here and push in the safety button and then squeeze the pump handle a few times. I think 
think I have to get it down a little lower. There it goes. It is working. Right now I don't see any leaks from the thing. But I think I'm still going to go and look around inside and see if I can see anything obviously loose. It's not being very enthusiastic, probably because I don't have that much of a... It's working a little better once I get a bit more height difference. Yeah, nothing's dripping out of it now. Hmm. Well, the uh, nozzle snapped off of this thing when I was trying to pry it apart because I thought it would snap apart, but it turns out it has screws in it, and they're just covered with little plastic um, plugs, the kind that I can probably dig out of here pretty easily with a um, small screwdriver, probably. Yeah, they just come out like little corks. All right, all the screws are exposed. all of them. There we go. So what do we have inside this thing? We have the basic pump up here and the handle. That safety thing is really a pain in the butt but I understand its reasoning. So you've got um, It actually draws on a uh, plunger here, so, and I can see there's the end of a gasket. I think I'll take the camera off the tripod so I can look at this better. So this is just a flexible hose here. I don't think it has any other functionality. It's just a, a way to get from this fitting up to the intake to the pump which actually can be unscrewed, almost as if it's replaceable. Um, interesting, they only use uh, zip ties for this. There's a little spring here. Um, not really sure what that's for. I guess it must be something to do with yeah, it provides the the return for this button here. Yeah, that's all it is. It just goes behind the button so that it springs back out. And the other end of that just uh, gets out of the way of the, the main lever. So pretty simple there. Now what have we here? This is the actual lever and it just um, pulls on that shaft or that shaft coming out of there by lifting that little bit there and turning it 90 degrees because it does turn then it disengages from the handle so I can see inside there there's a big coil spring and that's what you pull against now it's pretty stiff because it has that big spring in there. 
uh, and there's a little flapper here which when the flow goes the other way it acts like a check valve and closes off I suspect it's up against a rubber o-ring or something but that's gonna be um, the reverse flow so when you pump it I suppose that um, that only allows things to go out not in so I suspect this is just a diaphragm pump simple diaphragm pump and then once you get it started uh, the, flu the siphoning action just pulls the fuel through it but initially when you pump that bellows or not the bellows but when you pump against that diaphragm pulling down against the spring uh, it's going to create a cavity in here which draws fuel up and then when you release it it gets discharged when you pull on it that flapper flaps shut so nothing can go in this way to relieve the vacuum and that's why it pulls things up so really simple but then again there's going to be a chamber above the diaphragm that um, is always got room for the fuel to just siphon flow through there so very simple so I'm going to operate the uh, plunger here with the pliers so if I can get a grip on it So I've removed the cover here with four screws and there's that big spring and there's the diaphragm which we can now uh, hopefully <laughs> pull up and down so you've just got this I need to get some more light on there don't I So we've got this whole chamber here. The spring normally has it pushed down, but then when we pull up, it creates that big space there. So you're basically just pumping that like a bellows. And then the other side of it uh, just looks like that. It does have a, um, a rubber piece here that might be part of the same assembly, molded plastic assembly. Um, and I think it sits down on this, on this ring here. So let's see, when you push it in, yeah, I think normally the spring is pushing down on this so hard that this rubbery part here sits down on this so nothing can flow through and then when you squeeze the lever this lifts off of that and pulls up to create a chamber the only thing that I don't understand is how the fuel keeps siphoning through it when the spring is pushed well okay I answered my own question in order to keep the fuel flowing once it started siphoning or once you've got it going with this pump you have to keep the lever squeezed which will pull up against the spring and keep this guy uh, from sitting down on this yeah so that's actually kind of a classic way of doing it come to think of it and then uh, the fuel flows around and goes out past the check valve that's in this area the yellow check valve and out so very straightforward and as I said once you get it started with this uh, hand operated pump then the siphoning action will just continue to carry fuel through um, I pretty much ruined this pump taking it apart and it was leaking before anyway from somewhere it might have just been from right up here the the leaking happened when I would have the handle down so it'd be like this and if this uh, joint here was 
not tight anymore, it might have been dribbling out of that right at that position. But uh, yeah, it's interesting to see how that worked. Not a big revelation, but um, still. Uh, because I've broken off that nozzle, I don't think that they're going to supply me a replacement one of these. I probably could just jury rig something on there since that plate unscrews, but I'm not going to bother. The cost of these things is minimal as it is. I'm just going to buy a new one. But at least this one was sacrificial for a, a good bit of exploration. Don't need my flashlight still going. <laughs> 